Our Holy Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Sabbath rest. We thank you for bringing us together in community to learn more about you and the ways that you want to bless our lives and the way you want to use us for your kingdom, Father. I pray that you will clear our minds of any distraction and that you will speak to us clearly this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So our focus today is the gospel in action and how we can live out our faith in very tangible ways. Um, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month and May is Foster Awareness Month. And so we thought, what a great time to start that conversation about the needs in our community and also how we as Christ followers can make a difference in order to solve some very real challenges. Last week, I was at my son's game at Fleece Championship Sunday, and I saw many of you there to support your child or your your children. Some of you a little too supportive, if you know what I mean. Uh, But we all care for our children, and we want the best for our children. Uh, We love them. We, We yell at anyone including coaches, if that's what it takes because we're fierce defenders of our children. That's the way it should be. Maybe a little less passion in the field, but that's how we respond because we are parents. It's our God-given responsibility. It's our nature to be Uh, nurturing and to be protective of our children. Unfortunately, not every child experiences comfort and support and guidance. And not every child is reminded of the gospel, God's good news, that Jesus' love is available to them. So what if, what if each of us were moved to action in response to the need right here in our community. About eight or nine years ago, my husband and I were beginning the process of adopting our son from Ethiopia. And as I waited, I became obsessed with reading literature about the orphan and the needy and the fatherless to the point where it physically depressed me because I felt like the need was so great And yet I felt so small compared to it. What about the millions, I kept thinking? What about them? What about the ones left behind? So if you are feeling that way today, allow me to share a quote with you that meant so much to me and helped me gain some perspective. It says, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. What I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So sure, there are millions, and yes, you are just one. But what if all of us did something? And together, boy, what a difference would that make? Matthew 5.13 says that we are the light and the salt of the earth. Now, you get two examples of being light and salt imply to me that, that we are here to salt and light the place where God has put us at. I cannot throw some salt in the air and expect it to fall somewhere in Canada, can I? And neither someone in China can light up a lamp and expect it to illuminate my garage. So... The mere fact that we are all here in this community calls us to the responsibility to find out what the need is right here in our own backyard. And then it challenges each and every one of us to be salt and to be light. To be salt and to be light right here where we live. That's why we have with us today two local heroes in our community. Two champions who are every day spending every breath 
calling people to awareness of things that are happening right here in our area and also inviting people to join in the fight. So please help me welcome Penny Jones from the Penny Project and Marcos Perez from the Florida Abolitionist Organization. They've been here since first service. How do you feel? <laughs> it's been a long morning and I so appreciate you being here with us and uh, helping bring awareness to so many issues that we may not sometimes be aware of or may have probably heard about but aren't uh, fully tuned in. So thank you again for being with us. Um, Penny, let me start with you. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your organization, The Penny Project. I created the Penny Project in an effort to strengthen lives impacted by child abuse through advocacy and education. Okay. I had been going through a program called Life Work Leadership that teaches you about finding your calling and your purpose, mm -hmm. and it was that catalyst for me. Right, you, that's where you felt I, I the nudge. The, felt that divine nudge, yes. Now, you were at Florida Hospital for, uh, what, 22 20 years or some yeah. now, but you've always felt that like God was nudging you in this direction. Absolutely. What is it that fueled that passion? For me, I think one of the things that really sets my soul on fire was watching the light come on in a child's eyes. Mm. There is nothing quite like it when you are a part of that initial joy and watching that transformation when they feel safe wow. and begin to experience joy. Absolutely. Now, I know you have a sad story that was part yeah. of that yeah. uh, fuel. Quickly, I, um, I quickly fell in love with the foster care system. I wanted one little girl of my own. I was in the process of raising boys. Right. And I, um, we were sad. We were a sad family. And one of the reasons I you, got into foster care. Uh, you were going through a uh, divorce, a divorce right? at that time, right. which is where the sadness, sadness came, came from. from. Yeah. yeah, life changes. You know, sometimes life is hard right. and change is hard. Yeah. And I was in pursuit of what we call the helper's high. Mm. I wanted that happy endorphins that you get when you give back. Sure. So a friend at work picked up a packet and says, Penny, I feel that you are supposed to foster. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe on the weekends, me and the boys, we could take care of a baby. It's like babysitting. <laughs> but after that first little girl was in my home, my prayer began to change to, God, please send me one little girl that will stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. Soon it changed as each child would come and go. And I was getting older. <laughs> I began to pray, God, all right, I'll take whoever you send me before <laughs> I turn 50. Right. Because I was so empowered by this this experience and I wanted to broaden my family, grow my family through the dependency system. I know something devastating mm -hmm. happened afterwards. Yeah, well, you know, I had been fostering three children for two and a half years. My 50th birthday part arrived and those three children were reunified the same week. I felt like the skies had opened up and God told me I didn't get to adopt. Um, but I went on. I was, I was very empowered by the whole process. I threw a party. Does anybody else celebrate their 50th at Monkey Joe's? I did. <laughs> and, um, and then I went on and I began mentoring youth that have aged out of foster care. Um, around February 10 in 2014, just three months after turning 50, I received a call when, once I got to the office. And the call said, did you hear Taraji is dead? Taraji was the youngest of the sibling group I had just reunified. I can't describe the horror mm. and the pain that comes, but I immediately turned into the mama bear, right. said, if Taraji's dead, where are her siblings? Right. I, um, by the end of the day, I was at our local child advocacy center, Kids House of Seminole County, where I was picking up the three surviving siblings, mm. while meanwhile their biological mom had turned herself into jail and Taraji was found buried in a suitcase in another county. I brought them back to my house and Isis, who was then four, ran into the middle of our family room and she threw her arms to heaven and said, thank you for sending me back to my real mommy in my real house. Wow. 
They felt safe. They felt safe. And this, I, I had been her mommy for two and a half years. Right. I learned through the process that little ones don't really comprehend what's happening to them when they're being moved. I was always her mommy. Right. And she couldn't understand why I gave her away to this mean person. Oh, my goodness. So we began trauma therapy. Right. At first, I didn't think I was going to be able to keep Timothy. He was just... Timothy is the middle... T Timothy is my little boy. Yeah. He was three at the time, but he was violent. He had a tick that would just go, tragic, tragic. Um, but community-based care of Central Florida put a behavior list in our home who would teach me even the little things like, how do you get into a car? Hmm. And then you make that trip for weekly trauma sessions. And we slowly began to work it out. I began to see a difference in Timothy, but it was most relevant in his bedtime prayers. What started out as, please send Taraji back to me. I need her here with me. Mm -hmm. Then turned to, thank you for taking Taraji to heaven so mommy Rachel can't hurt her no more. Then turned into, give her a hug and a kiss mm -hmm. for me. There was now healing I, happening. Yeah, yeah, I could see it <laughs> happening. I still haven't figured out how to work in the second coming aspect of, <laughs> of it. We'll just, let, we'll just go with the flow on this one. And by Christmas, the girls had both graduated from trauma therapy, mm. but Timothy was still, he was afraid, he was angry. He was angry because he was mad. He wanted his sister back still, and he wanted to make sure I was never going to leave him. So I, as you can we see, we have a, a video. Video, little video, right, of this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Timothy, I love you forever. Okay, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Any tackle or not, Neil? <laughs> well, we did. We finally made it to the amazing one month later adoption day. Um, it was amazing. We, um, I can't really describe because finally. No one can take them away. It's a complicated judicial system with a lot of parents, a lot of relatives and nice. systems. But on January 22nd, Central Florida wholeheartedly welcomed three new Joneses to the community. <laughs> did they understand what was happening they did. at that point? They did. They knew. By this point, we'd gone through enough therapy where they comprehended, I never meant to give them away. I see. It was the system that I always wanted to keep them with me, mm -hmm. and I always want to keep them away. I wasn't going, at first they thought adoption meant I was going to give them away to someone mean again. Mm -hmm. So adoption day was huge. Within a week, I captured the following video, and you can judge for yourself. <laughs> adopted, I got adopted. I got adopted, adopted, adopted. We got adopted, we got adopted. We really got adopted. Our mom gave us a guy dog. We got adopted. We got yeah. my birds. We got adopted. We got adopted. We got adopted. I got a I got adopted song. We love you, our family. Da get adopted. We get big sometimes. We get big. <laughs> and they haven't slowed down since. So. How prevalent is child abuse? How prevalent is a story like Taraji's story? They in say Florida? five children die from child abuse in our country every single day. Every day. Mm -hmm. Every day. Every single day. 
And the numbers are up here in Central Florida, and not of the child, I don't know about the child death, but the numbers coming into the foster care system. Since 2013, we've had an increase by 23% of children coming into the foster care system. 13% are placed in foster homes, but the foster home growth has only increased by 4%. So there's a great need, not only for foster care families, but for good foster care families yes. who will take care and nurture um, children, mm -hmm. be a consistent yes. voice in their lives. They say um, every child is just one caring adult from a, a success story. Say that again? One caring child, every child is one caring adult from a success story. Wow. All it takes is one child. All it takes is one One adult for yeah. a child, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One adult that will, that will be that consistent yeah. voice in their lives. Mm -hmm. Now, Marcus, um, tell us a little bit about your work with the Florida Abolitionist Organization. Sure. So, Florida Abolitionist is an anti-human trafficking 501c3 nonprofit organization based out of here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, our mission is to end modern slavery, which is human trafficking. Uh, we do this through networking and facilitating uh, different preventative and restorative solutions through collaborating with different community uh, organizations and uh, grassroots efforts uh, and to help accomplish this. Uh, my role with the organization is as the demand prevention coordinator. I work on the demand prevention side. In other words, I work with the men and help and educate them about the harmful effects of pornography uh, as pornography is the big catalyst that helps fuel the demand for human trafficking. Uh, so I also coordinate and facilitate an accountability group for these men uh, as they're being educated to help provide them an atmosphere where they can find healing and recover uh, from their unwanted sexual behaviors or addictions uh, and begin to cultivate uh, a new perspective, a better attitude uh, towards women, towards sexuality so that they can have uh, sexual integrity and healthy intimacy. Yeah, as we've heard it before, and I know you mentioned it, that if we got rid of pornography, human trafficking would end forever. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Tell us, what does child abuse have to do with human trafficking? Yeah, I mean, the two are interlinked. Um, a lot of times, these traffickers, the pimps, they prey on the vulnerable, the youth, uh, those that are oftentimes underprivileged, that are runaways, that are homeless, that come from dysfunctional backgrounds, and uh, a lot of times they're kids. And, and the market right now in the human trafficking realm, they target more and more younger kids. Uh, there was a, a recent report released uh, for the Canadian Coalition uh, to Protect Children, uh, and their stats analyzed videos and images online of kids that sex buyers pursued and oftentimes looked at, and uh, they found that 78% of the images and pictures online were of kids 12 years old or younger. 64% uh, were of kids 8 years old or younger. Oh uh, so it's pretty prevalent. Oh my goodness, wow. You mentioned something at the last service that it really shocked me. What is the prevalence of human trafficking right here in, in Central Florida? Yeah, uh, Florida stands as the third state in the nation uh, prevalent for having human trafficking here in our state. Uh, Orlando is actually the third city in the nation per capita, uh, followed by Miami and Tampa. The third yes. in the nation. In the nation, yeah. Number one is Washington, D.C., number two is Atlanta. So we can tell that this is a huge problem in our area. Absolutely. And some, definitely something not to be ignored. No, no. What does a success story look like for your organization? Sure. Uh, so since the Florida Abolitionist has been around for the past nine years, we've helped identify and recover over 500 survivors of human trafficking here within the greater Orlando area. Uh, we constantly are receiving phone calls and recovering between two to five victims between women and men per week. Uh, in fact, this week we received 25 phone calls. Wow. Uh, but one specific story is of a young girl named Jenny uh, who's 15 years old. Uh, we helped recover last year. Uh, Jenny was just your average teen teenager, you know, uh, normal girl that you can see from the outside looking in, you know, with hopes, dreams, ambitions. Uh, but one day she was befriended by an uh, older woman, uh, not much older than her. Uh, and basically this woman gained Jenny's trust and kind of showered her with gifts and friendship. Uh, but it was all a, a, a trick to misguide her into luring her into a sex trafficking ring. Uh, basically she introduced Jenny into uh, to a local gang here.
here, uh, who actually then proceeded to, to rape her and abuse her uh, and actually take photos of her and advertise her on websites such as Backpage.com, uh, which is a huge website, kind of similar to Craigslist. Uh, our organization was actually involved in a national lawsuit against Backpage, uh, which actually resulted in the passing of the recent law, uh, the FOSTA-SESTA bill, which uh, allowed the FBI to raid their office and shut them down uh, and actually prosecute the executives. Yeah. Uh, but that's where a lot of the bulk of the human trafficking was being taken place on. Uh, so they advertised her on these websites. They housed her in two very impoverished, run-down homes here in the Orange County area. Uh, and for the next two weeks, they would pretty much pimped her out to several commercial sex buyers uh, in the region at 15 years old. Uh, thankfully, for due to an anonymous tip received, uh, the local law enforcement were able to go in and rescue Jenny and apprehend the traffickers. And uh, being first responders with FA, they contact us and we meet them there on the scene to recover the victim. Uh, we provide her with the basic essential needs, a backpack with just some goods. Uh, we take her then into a residential housing to provide her shelter and food and, of course, treatment for trauma therapy given what she's gone through. Uh, and this uh, fast forward a few months and almost a year now, she's actually doing quite well. Um, she's been recovering and she's been healing. Um, and uh, we learned that Jenny's actually a basketball fan. And so we, through local partnerships here in the city, we got the Orlando Magic to get a signed basketball for her. Um, and uh, she also told us that she wanted to begin reading the Bible. So we gave her a Bible as well. And, and just these little small gestures like that. Uh, but they go a long way in helping somebody understand and know that they're loved and valued after going through something like that. So there's a long term care as well that's involved when you're recovering Absolutely, victims. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we do stay in touch with them. Of course, we partner with different organizations right. such as Aspire Health Partners here, DCF, and many other incredible agencies. Uh, but we always, with our uh, victim advocacy agents, we do of oftentimes follow up. And a lot of times we do have a couple of the survivors that actually work with us now and go into different events and share their testimony. Wow. Uh, there's so much to process there. Yeah. Um, Penny, tell us some of the uh, signs to look for when when we're looking for child abuse, something that we should keep in mind? Mm -hmm. Well, I am a firm believer that, you know, our secretary talks about protecting the light in a child's eyes. And I always like to look in a child's eyes because abused children don't belly laugh or their eyes don't sparkle, they don't laugh uncontrollably. But they also, there's signs like bruising, unexplained constant bruising, not making eye contact. Um, poor attendance in certain things, um, emotional outcries. You know, there's a lot of great research on the website. I Googled some last night to kind of refresh my memory. Mm -hmm. It's the Child Welfare Gateway it has a wonderful PDF there that you can pull up for all different kinds of scenarios and look at signs. Sure. You know, and if you are, so you cannot be too safe when you are protecting our children are innocent mm -hmm. until we teach them else. Elsewise, otherwise, and uh, you know we have an abuse hotline, which is, which we have here on this, on the, I think on the final slide, and um, you know there are ways to stop this. Our children are our greatest asset. If you talk to them, I know my children during their reunification, they went to their daycare, like I told them to, and told them, "Mommy Rachel didn't send Taraji today because she has a boo boo. She doesn't want anyone to see." Hmm. So, there were so signs children there. will tell you. Mm -hmm. Children don't go and fabricate this unless there's an adult behind them teaching or coaxing them to do that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned mentoring beforehand. Yeah. This is something that yeah. you have been involved yeah. on and off throughout your foster care um, ministry. What are some ways that we can get involved with with uh, mentoring, because there may be someone who says, okay, well, I don't feel called to adopt. I don't mm -hmm. feel like I can d do foster yeah. care, but mentoring, maybe that's something I can do. You know, there's two ways. You know, there's um, fostering. There's a group called Bridges of Light here in town, and they, they provide mentors inside group, group facilities. These are like your Great Oaks Village or places where children aren't able to roam as freely as my children may be able to. Others are um, the Foundation for Foster Children, and I left some cards at the back display table. That's who's helping me. Mm -hmm. And then I pick up my mentee from her, she's in a group home, and on Sundays she'll come with us, or she'll come over, we'll bake cookies, we'll go watch my son play football. Mm -hmm. Whatever her bandwidth is, I try to bring her into okay. the family. Um, but she's been through a rough road. Okay. Um, I think with mentoring, you can be that consistent adult in a child's life long term 
Sure, there may be t you know gaps in the time that you see them, but if you were there long term, I actually there were two youth that I became involved with when my kids were reunified that aged out of foster care. They had a baby and asked me to be the grandma. Mm. Now that's my greatest joy because daddy's now serving an eight-year prison term, but mama has stepped up and I am, that baby calls me Yaya. She turned three and her eyes sparkle. And it's, it's, it's my greatest joy. And I'm sure the mom also relies yeah, on she your does, wisdom. And I relies on her too now. Now she's part of her family. The yeah. mom has blended into our family. So I'm starting the FBI Citizen Academy. Mom's gonna come babysit for me. And so we've created this cool kind of support network. Yeah. 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 How can we get involved with your organization? Absolutely. So as a faith community, I always encourage us to pray first. I mean, that's, I think, the biggest weapon we have, right? Because uh, the battle that we fight is a spiritual one, not one of mm -hmm. flesh. And, and so I love a quote, in fact, by John Bunyan. I think he says, you can do anything after you've prayed, but you can't do anything until you've prayed. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's first and foremost. But the second thing is uh, you can actually attend one of our regional trainings that FA hosts uh, every uh, couple months. We actually have one today going in tandem with this event here at Calvary Orlando right now. Uh, the next one is going to be June 30th at Calvary Orlando. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Saturday training from 11 to 4 and uh, but there you'll pretty much learn everything you need to learn about human trafficking from beginning to end and how you can get involved with our organization, all the different departments that we have, uh, whether it be again through just giving financially uh, as we are a 501c3 and we're able to operate through the giving of those in the community such as yourselves uh, or with your time if you have a specialty and you want to work with some of the victims uh, or just volunteer at a, at a table or an event or, uh, of course, uh, yeah, think time, prayer, and, and finances and stuff like that. Um, but the biggest thing, too, is uh, we go by a motto, say, you see something, say something. Even if you're kind of unsure if whether or not it is human trafficking, as Penny was mentioning, some of the factors or indications that you can kind of pick up on uh, uh, activity that a child may be going through, whether they're absent from school or you're seeing some bruising or a sudden change in their affect or behavior all of a sudden, uh, or you see something somebody with somebody else but that other person is speaking on this person's behalf uh, just things like that you can call the national human trafficking hotline uh, that number is 888-3737-888 you can make an anonymous phone call and I highly encourage you please to take advantage of that that's actually how that girl Jenny was recovered uh, 15, uh, 15 year old that I told you about and so this is definitely a, a credible and tool here if you here. can't remember that then it's 911 is also another way to absolutely, do that. Absolutely, absolutely. They all work together through the investigative process. Sure. Um, and then, of course, I think just yourself as, as people uh, and grassroots efforts, which is how our organization started. I love the quote you shared earlier about, you know, even though I'm just one, you are one and you make a difference. Uh, there was this individual down in South Florida, this, this attorney, uh, Liza Smoker, who felt a burden in her heart to want to create awareness in the community about the harmful effects of pornography and the links between human trafficking. And she drafted together a resolution to present to our, uh, our legislative assistants. And we came alongside her. We went to the Capitol and lobbied. And we got the resolution passed a couple months ago. So uh, pornography is officially declared a public health crisis in the state of Florida yeah. as a result of that. Wow. So you guys can make a difference. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. I think the work that you do is so inspiring and it really, um, I appreciate what you do in the community. It makes a, a difference. It reminds me of 1 John 3, 17, 18, which says that let us not love with words and or speech, but with action and in truth. And that's what they do every day in and, and day out. So thank you again for being here, taking time to share with us. They have tables out in the lobby. And so if anyone wants more information and to chat more, um, you're going to stay for a few more minutes and yes. um, anyone that wants to get more information. Um, so I, as we wrap up our conversation, I want us to read the verse in Isaiah 117. We'd love for all of us to read it together. It says, learn to do good. Commit yourselves to, to seeking, seeking justice. justice. Make, Make right, right for the, the world's, world's most vulnerable, vulnerable the, the oppressed, the, the orphaned, orphaned the and the widow. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs>